All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 8. Thank you, Joe, Mark, and Ethan. Hallelujah. Talking to you guys this morning. Um, Genesis 8, we'll look at verses 6 through 12. I'm going to quote for you a verse that I often quote when we're dealing with this subject matter. It's Hosea 12 and verse 10, which says, I have also spoken by the prophets and have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So I think that we're going to see that this morning when we take a look at the birds in the text. Um, so let's pray. Father, help us to see everything that we need to see this morning out of this amazing and mysterious book of Genesis. We give you praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, verse 6 says, And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Remember we talked about the windows? Come on, come on, I'm hearing rumblings and talking, and that's going to be very distracting. So can we... All right, come on in. Um, we talked about these windows, and it's going to be a bad picture now because of the darkness of the slide. But right here, there's a picture of an ark. I think this is far more descriptive, actually, just this box-like thing. Here's the door. I know it's difficult to see. And then there's one little window right above it, as opposed to something like this that you so very often see. And we talked about that, that you know, is it a bunch of windows? I know this is trite stuff, you know, as far as <laughs> the importance of what we're going to talk about today. But just because it was in the text, and I remember saying, I don't know which it was, but it sure seems to indicate that it's one window if Noah opened the window of the ark. That's one small window. Because, I mean, if you go back to the sixth chapter, look at verse 16. Uh, you're close by. Go ahead and look at it. It says, A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit thou shalt finish it above. Well, what's a cubit? You know, I mean, people argue it's either 18 to 24 inches. So let's even say it's a 24 inch. 24 by 24. That is one small window. For, I've got, a, I got bigger windows in my house, and my house isn't the size of an aircraft carrier. So that's, again, you're talking about trusting God while the waters are flowing, floating you don't know where, 40 days of water, not even probably sure exactly if it's going to stop, because let's be honest, our faith is imperfect. Going, oh, is this ever going to stop, right? And in the dark, because you're now hunkered down because the water's falling at about the rate of six inches per second, or per minute, I mean, not per second, per minute, which would be almost suffocating, so you'd have to be in the ark. Yeah, that's, uh, that's difficult. He went, Noah had a lot of faith. He had a lot of faith, more than I got, i got to be honest with you, um, at least I think. Verse 7, let's move on to the similitudes. And he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. So the first bird is a raven. It is an unclean fowl by the standard of the Mosaic law. And I want you to see that, that's in Leviticus chapter 11, go ahead and flip over there. Leviticus chapter 11. We're going to talk a little bit about the law and the service to come in dealing with that subject matter of what the Bible says about homosexuality. Because the law is so very often either used to break up what we believe about homosexuality as Christians, um, or it's used to sh show an apparent contradiction in our lives, but we'll explain that away. Uh, and we're going to have to do this in a couple of weeks, too, by the way, if not three, but probably two. Leviticus 11, verse 13 says, And these are they which ye shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey. What's an os ossifrage and an osprey? No one's for sure. Likely buzzard-like animals because it's fitting into kind of a category that they're talking about as you move down to verse 14, right? The vulture, the kite after his kind, verse 15, 
every raven after his kind. So there's the unclean bird that you find on the ark. So let's just finish up the list though. Verse 16. And the owl and the night hawk and the cuckow and the hawk after his kind. What's a cuckow or a cuckow? Uh, no one knows. Some people say it's a seagull. <laughs> the, the cuckoo bird? I don't know. Verse 17. That's where the cuckoo, he, he got off the ark and he was done, right? Or, the, or maybe that's the dodo bird, right? Um, verse 17. And the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl. What's a cormorant? This was great. I'm, so I'm looking at these, you know, I'm always checking out what the commentators have to say. And the cormorant, it says, in quote, thought to be a pelican. Okay, next verse. And the swan and the pelican. In the Greer Eagle. So I would say, uh, no, not a pelican or God wouldn't have called it two different things and listed it twice. It baffles me how quickly they have these comments and suppositions when the next verse tells you you're wrong. Anyhow, verse 19, and the stork, the heron after her kind, the lapwing and the bat. What's a lapwing? Mm, no one knows. I've heard a commentator, but this is the same commentator who said that the pelican is probably the cormorant. So I don't know how trustworthy it is, but they say it's the hopo bird. Anyone know what a hopo bird is? Me either. Uh, it looks like, I looked it up though, it is a bird, and it looks like a little hummingbird. But I don't know what it is. Verse 20, I'm, I'm assuming that during the time of Moses, all the Jews knew exactly what those birds were. So we, don't, we couldn't even follow this right now because we don't even know what birds not to eat. Because I don't even know what they are. Right? And, I don't, maybe, maybe it would go to the Jew and maybe they know exactly what it is. Maybe they have a list of what it is modern times. I don't know. Maybe a rabbinical Jew, right? Uh, verse 20, All fowls that creep going upon all fours shall be an abomination unto you. Say, wait a minute. How, how do fowls creep on four? But they do. A bat goes on four. If you've ever seen a bat on the ground, it's got its two you know, winged things and then the two back feet, ugly as all get out. You don't ever want to see them. But that's the best spot to see a bat on the ground. Seriously, because then you're not in trouble because they can't just jump up and fly. Only a, only a vampire bat can do that. Just a little, uh, I don't know, give you a little wild kratz this morning or whatever my son watches, right? Um, so the raven, oh, wait a minute, what's not on that list? What's not on that list? What's the other bird that we're talking about today? A dove. So it's, a dove's not an unclean bird. It's a clean bird, right? The raven, a black bird, obviously stands out in contrast to a dove, a white bird. This is, of course, not about race. It's about the difference between light and dark. Um, that's the picture. To run to race on either side of the color spectrum is to show your true colors. So upon release, where did the raven go according to the text? Go back to Genesis. Where did it go? What is it? To and fro. All right, let's get the book of Job. Let's get Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. See, this is how you study your Bible. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You're going to want to compare words. You're going to want to compare phrases. If I can offer you some advice, don't assume the word is right. Assume, it's, or assume the word is wrong. Assume it's right. And if you don't believe it, assume you're not right. And verse 6 of Job 1 says, Now, there was a day when the sons of God... Those would be angelic beings, not sons of Seth. Came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. If they were the godly line of Seth, why would they and Satan be hanging out together? And how would they present themselves before the Lord? I don't think the, the lineage of Seth could fly to the third heaven. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, you say, well, how do you know that the Lord wasn't on the earth? Because here's the question. Whence comest thou? 
Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. So I came from the earth. I'm no longer obviously in the earth. I'm talking to you, Lord. So the sons of God are there as well. It's not the line of Seth. Okay? But what was Satan doing? What does he do? To and fro. In this earth. And in the second heaven. And in the first heaven, by the way. Earth, first heaven, second heaven. To and fro, to and fro. You'll read this again in chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the word is established. That's what Satan does. He goes to and fro. Well, that's what the raven did. It goes to and fro. The raven is an unclean bird. In Scripture, all unclean fowl is representative of, anyone know? Class, anyone? Unclean spirits. Unclean spirits. You'll read about the stork-like uh, spirit, female spirit being that uh, is in Zechariah chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. I'm just referencing it. Um, and that was... Uh, a stork is, uh, makes its way on that list of unclean animals. And so it's, it's just a type of evil spirits. So the raven, very specifically, is a type of which unclean spirit that goes to and fro? Satan. So the raven is a picture of Satan. This bird finds no rest. She is black, as in not in the color of her skin, but in the darkness of her heart. She is a bird of prey. And she tears at the flesh. That's what she does. You think about the root of the word. What, is, what, is, what does ravenous mean? R ravishingly hungry. I'll tear you apart kind of hungry. That's what, that's what a raven is. That's what she does. Look at uh, 1 Peter. Chapter 5. Very famous verses for us Bible believers. 1 Peter 5 and verses 8 and 9 say, Be sober. Bam. bam. Oh, where does it say you can't drink in, you know, in the Bible? Well, it tells you to be sober. And a little sidetrack. Let's talk about it for a second. So I throw back a beer at the end of a hard day, and I don't feel anything. You know, it's a hot day. Threw it back. Feel good. I'm not saying I do. I haven't touched alcohol in many years. <laughs> right. Closest I get is to you know, grandma's cough syrup at, on you know, uh, uh, when I'm sick, Nyquil or something. Um, but they. Uh, the moment you throw back a beer, right, the next day, let's say this is my pattern, hard day's work. Well, my body, my, my physiological makeup is not always the same from day to day. So the next day, that same amount of alcohol might get me loopy. It's true. Anyone that is a former drinker knows, well, some days I had more tolerance than other days. But I don't know upon which days I'm going to exhibit that tolerance. So you can't ever know whether or not you're going to get drunk until you've gotten drunk. So therefore, you're already sinning, and you don't know you've sinned until you sinned. So just like pregnancy, the only way to not be pregnant is to not it's to abstain from relations. The only way to know for sure that I'm never going to get drunk is to abstain from alcohol. Okay, be sober. Why? Because you've got an enemy. So you best not be walking around like this. Because he'll whoop you. Right? All the guys with the beer muscles. <laughs> you know, you've got to worry about you. Because if you d you're not even going to get close to striking me, I could just do this, <laughs> you know. So it's just funny. Be sober. Be vigilant. 
You know what? I got to share. I'm going off on so many tangents. I got to share this from last night. I, pray for this gentleman. But Wendy and I are going to pick up the boys last night. And I'm driving down Como Park Boulevard. And there's a guy walking down the street towards us. And up, up away, I saw a van kind of veer off. I thought, I don't know, what was there, an animal or something in the road or something? But I was, it made me pay attention. So I'm walking and, or driving, and here comes this man. And he goes, and as soon as he gets too close to the car, he goes like this and runs right out in front of us. I slam, pull the vehicle, screech the whole car. He tried to jump out in front of us. Just like that. Be sober. Be sober. And I, I'm poor Wendy. She's out of surgery. And it's whiplash in her. So unfortunately, your pastor didn't ask, act very pastoral. I was angry. Right? So I pulled over. I said, Wendy, call 911. And I turned around. And I followed him. And I said, I just called the police so you know. And I'm mad. And I'm swearing at him or anything, but I'm mad. Right? And he goes, what for? I said, because you jumped out in front of my car and I saw you did it to the other person just up the way. And I'm thinking, in my mind, this guy's just being a jerk. Yeah. Wendy, of course, being a little more spiritual than I was because I was angry, was thinking, well, maybe he was actually trying and he unsuccessfully saw I wasn't going to get to that car. They, they saw me and veered off. Pray for that man. I, when we came back, we came back through Como Park. There were five police cars, and he was sitting on the grass, handcuffed. So, but yeah, I don't know if it was legitimate, trying to kill himself or what. But um, makes me go, you know, not gotten angry. I should talk to this poor man. You know, I don't know. But you know, I also need to protect my wife. I don't know if the guy's going to pull out a knife or a gun or something. I don't know. He's obviously not in his right mind. But anyhow, pray for him. But this is a good, it's a good message to bring sobriety. Pay attention, because you never know what's going to come out. And one of those things is, ready? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, that's what I thought, maybe this guy even had an unclean spirit, which is not, un, would not out of her, you know, unheard of, if he's trying to hurt himself. Uh, as a roaring lion... Walking about seeking whom he may what? He's ravenous. The devil's a raven. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So God, listen, God is a roaring lion according to the scripture. He roars. The devil wants to be like him. I will be like the Most High. So he, he says... Um, he is as a roaring lion. But God roars, he doesn't devour. Satan, his roar isn't all that much. You know, he's, he's as a roaring lion. He's trying. He's not as good as God, but he's certainly devouring. He, he wants to eat you up. So, he goes to and fro in the earth. He's very unsettled. Very unsettled, which is important. I want to show you something. Go to Mark chapter 5. You know the story of Legion? All my sidetracks, and I'm going to make a slate. Mark 5, look at verses. We'll start in verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwellings among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been off, often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. He can't be tamed. He can't be settled. He's a creature that goes to and fro, and to and fro, and to and fro. Or as Job 41, verses 1 and 2 say, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through uh, with a thorn? Can you catch him like you'd catch a fish is what that's asking. No, you cannot. He, he can't be chained. He's too unsettled and too powerful. Verse 5, 
And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. So he dwells among the dead. Those he possesses are depressed. They cry. And they're cutters. They cut themselves. Or they want to afflict or hurt themselves. That is not a normal thought. And by the way, that doesn't mean that everyone that does that is possessed. But what it does mean is that you've got something going on. There's a spirit of this age. Um, you know, you wonder about this unsettled mind. We are always, you know, oh, they're, they're ADHD, they're ADHD. Um, okay, well, maybe we're just proving the Bible that Satan is the God of this world and as we get further and further away from the God of the Bible and get closer and closer to the God of this world that we'll be like him. His time is short, he knows it. So I gotta, you know, it's kind of like if you, they, even death row prisoners they give, what, what's your last meal, what do you want, anything on the menu? Right? Oh, give me a steak, and I want a lobster tail. So why? Because, well, I'm just like my daddy. And I'm just trying to devour everything I can before my end. Before my stay in hell. So, year of your father the devil, the lusts of your father you will do, John 8, 44. Including having a spirit that cannot be tamed, can't be settled, you, listen, you can dope that boy up all you want and make him the walking dead. But what he really needs is a visitation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to bring something to settle that heart and that mind. And I would say the same for even saved people, born again Christians, who aren't settled. You need to get closer to Jesus. Watch this. Let's move on further down the story. Look at verse 15. And they come to Jesus, of course he casts out this legion. They come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. So what's he not doing anymore? He's not with the dead. He's not hanging out in the tombs. He's not crying. He's not cutting himself. He's not always, day and night, he's sitting with Jesus. And he's right. And who gets afraid when Jesus cleans up the mind of a child of Satan? The locals. They were afraid. They, you weren't afraid of them before? Now you're afraid. Because... The Lord touched him and healed him. You know what the fear is now? It's not that worldly fear of that guy, that, that crazy guy that's in the tombs. Right? It's a fear of Jesus and his return. Fear him that is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the fear. So, they'd ra the, the honest truth is most of this world would rather have the legion than Jesus. And that's the truth. So let's get to the next bird now. Back to Genesis 8, 8 and 9. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. This bird desires rest. That's why she is, to this day even, in our country and around the world, she represents what? What does the dove represent? Peace. 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 Contentment. Not running to and fro. Not crazy. Peace. That's the Bible's influence, even, even upon this wicked world. Um, that whenever someone wants to picture peace, they'll put a, a dove there with an olive branch plucked off in the mouth. Where do they get that from? 
Unlike the raven who flew around and around and around that first heaven, rather than stay in the ark, he left his first estate and didn't want to go back. The dove is not comfortable away from the ark. This clean bird is in search of something. By the way, it's obvious. What's the bird? What is the, what's the type? What's the similitude? The Holy Ghost, we know that when John the Baptist saw Jesus being, you know, when he came up, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him, right? So we know what this is. This is a type of the Holy Spirit. The bird is also represented in Eliezer of Damascus. Say, who's Eliezer of Damascus? That would be Abraham's servant. Uh, he was also sent out in search of something. Does anyone know what he was in search of? A bride for Isaac. Isaac is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a child of promise, a child of faith. He's the promised seed who went willingly with Father Abraham to the sacrifice. That's, that's a type of Jesus. And, and this Isaac, he wants a bride. That bride, as it turns out, is us. The bridegroom is Christ and Eliezer of Damascus and the dove picture a type of the Holy Spirit of God going out into the world with the gospel message with the people who bear the Holy Spirit to bring more and more people into that body, the bride. Look at John chapter 3. Oh, John chapter 3. And verse 5. I don't know how you can't fall in love with a book like this. It's amazing. It's an amazing book. You get this question all the time. Well, how do you know what you know so much about the Bible? Well, I've read it a lot, number one. Number two, two study to show thyself approved unto God. I mean, you've got to put some work in, put some effort in. Like anything else, how do you become an expert on Moby Dick? Well, not by putting it on the shelf and never reading it. Well, when I read the first verse, and I just don't understand it. Okay, well then you're never going to, because you put it down. Keep reading it. Get past the I don't get it. And just keep reading it and get, become acquainted with it. John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that's truth. That's 100% that's truth if you're concerned for your soul. You want to get into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You need to be born of water and of the Spirit. Verse six, uh, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's all of us in our natural state. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I am now a spiritual being inside of a carnal being. But that's okay. They're not attached. Colossians chapter 2. There's a circumcision made without hands. My body is not attached to my soul and spirit. My body will still go down to the grave, be punished. That's why it's old and gets older and older. But my, my soul will never know a day of corruption. Marvel not, verse 7 says, uh, that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the what? The Spirit. The work of gathering the believer belongs unto the Spirit of God. It is not even our job. You can't gather someone into Christ. What you can do is share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody, and upon their believing the gospel, the Holy Spirit will then seal them unto the day of redemption. You have no part in your salvation. You have no part in anyone else's salvation. You say, well, I led someone to the Lord the other day. Praise the Lord. What that means is you gave the gospel, right? You sent out the hook, right? You sent out a line into the water. And that bait is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that fish bit. I'll make you fishers of men. It bit. But it bit as an act of their will. And they got reeled in, not by you. That's a work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, uh, go to Revelation chapter 22. Verse 
not by the will of man. Revelation 22, verses 16 and 17 say, I, Jesus, have sent forth mine angel to testify unto you the things in the churches, these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. See, I am the, I am the root, right? That's, that's Romans chapter 11 that we were talking about this past Wednesday night. That, uh, that root and the branches that are in the root and graft in, and we're graft into the, the root and offspring of David. We get in on his gospel and his salvation. Praise the Lord. He's the bright and morning star, verse 17. And the Spirit, right? That's, that's the dove, the Holy Ghost. And the bride, that's us, say what? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Come. Let him that heareth, come. Let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, right? Whosoever will may come. Let him take the water of life freely. It's a free gift. Don't even try to offer anything. Well, Lord, do you want me to get baptized? No, I'm, not, I don't, I'm giving it to you free. Well, do you want me to join a church? Yes, but not to get this gift. How do I get, how do I get saved? You receive the gift. Well, how do, how do I, when will he give it to me? When you trust him. So who's waiting for the return of the bridegroom? The bride, right? Typically the bride wants to, you know, hang out with the husband, typically. And the spirit given to the bride as the comforter in the time that we're waiting for him. Because I'm going to need that comfort until I get to see him one day. So we work together, the Spirit of God and I, and the Spirit of God and you, if you're saved, and hopefully you all are this morning. And the same Spirit who searched us out as the bride for Christ. He wants the Lord to return. So that's, that's the work of the Holy Ghost. Verses eight, or 10, 11, and 12 in Genesis, and we'll close up. And get ourselves ready for the second service. 10, 11, and 12 say... And he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. So now the, the, the dove doesn't come back. Why? Her work's done. Note the number 7, verses 10 and 12, in connection to the finished work of the Holy Spirit of God. And so let's see the whole of history wrapped up from, the first, from 1 Corinthians. And here's where we'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 22 down through 28. So you're going to see all of human history beginning to end right here wrap up and something happens and, and, and the work of God is done. Uh, verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. There's your first 4,000 years of human history. From the garden to Christ. 4,000 years, right there in one, in one sentence. Verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ said is coming. There it concludes for, uh, for us, the church, at rapture. Off to be with the bridegroom. Verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. Now it jumps to the end of the millennium. When Jesus, he, Jesus, now gives God the Father everything. He reigned for a thousand years. He now turns it over to God the Father. And, and man's rule has come to an end, by the way. Right? For he must reign, Christ till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, praise the Lord. 
For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest, it's obvious, it's revealed, that he is accepted which did put all things under him. God the Father is accepted. There's a couple of different ways you can look at it. God the Father is the exception to being under the feet of Jesus. And he's, he had for a time, for right up until the end of the millennium, he had accepted himself and laid himself aside to give glory unto the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, to receive a kingdom. And when the fullness of time comes upon us, the work of the Spirit is done, verse 28, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, which is God the Father, that God may be all in all. So exactly how that's going to work, I'm not sure, but the Son and the Spirit, I would assume the Spirit as well, though God is a Spirit, but they subject themselves to God the Father after the millennial reign of Christ. And all of human history has come to an end at 7,000 years of human history, and the work of God is at rest. Now, I don't know, for our history, the work of God is at rest. What it will be out in the future, and if he creates a new people, I mean, we know there's a new heaven and a new earth. What he'll do from there, I don't know. But the God we know, as we know him, the triune God, will come to rest. And God the Father will be all in all. That's the verses that, as I understand them. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, all that from two little birds? Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's quite a book. It's quite a book. All right, Father, thank you. Uh, for this time in the book of Genesis. We do pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you'd be with us in the hour to come in uh, this Healing the Heart series. Lord, I pray that you'd fill your house. I know we've got a lot of people that are missing. Uh, I do pray there'd be more people than we see now. It's summer is upon us in Buffalo. Oh, Lord, please work in the hearts of your people to not make summer the priority, but make you the priority. Um, and I understand people go out of town, and that's all well and good, Lord. Um, but I pray that they'd have some private time with you this morning and throughout the day. And those who aren't really going anywhere and just want to sit out and enjoy a sunshine, Lord, I pray that you'd convict their heart to come here and enjoy the sun, the Lord Jesus Christ, first, and then enjoy the sunshine uh, in the hours to follow. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.